Okay, so um, yeah, it's a nice opportunity to talk about the theme of the day and maybe your practice or anything that you know comes up around this theme or any other theme really that you're working on in your practice or in your lives in general. Um, it's a nice opportunity to share because sometimes you think, oh, what a silly question, I can't ask that. Or you think, oh, no one else has this kind of problem. And when you hear other people, you realize, oh, actually, they're just like me. And uh, we're all just beginning, you know, on this path. So it's nice to share. And uh, we'll see what comes out. We'll both respond. So if you have anything, anyone has anything, yes. Um, so thinking about forgiveness, um, it's probably a bad example, but, but um, at work, I've been working on a couple of different things. I don't do particularly significant work, so it's not that much of a problem, but basically the boss just sort of like, said, just wiped it away, said, no, we're not doing that, that's rubbish, and just left. And obviously that left me feeling somewhat aggravated, right? And so... I know forgiveness isn't quite the word, but I thought, oh, well, I'll let go of it. I'll, f I'll forgive it. I'm not told it against him and just carry on. And one of the consequences of that I've found is that I care a lot less about the work entirely. And, and I think it could be the same in relationships sometimes with people like, like the... I mean, no one's ever done me anything as bad as, say, the Muslim farm that was spoken about earlier or, you know, they've been murdered or anything like that. It's minor things, but but when people have done me, you know, don't <laughs> don't do me wrong, but it's it's like, um, what's the difference between forgiving, maybe cutting off, perhaps? Uh, yeah, yeah. Really good you know what I mean? it's, uh, yeah. So the question for the recording is, um, in brief, what is the difference between cutting and for, uh, cutting off? and forgiving, because sometimes we have to, uh, sometimes there's just an effect on the heart when somebody does something to us that's kind of mean or dismissive or disrespectful, and we can close down a little bit. And I think the clue is in the way it makes us feel. I think forgiveness is something that embraces and that opens the heart, whereas cutting off is sometimes a closed down kind of feeling. But sometimes we can have a sense of opening our heart to ourselves at least, um, and yet still making a decision to move away from a relationship in our life. It doesn't have to be done with coldness. It doesn't have to be done in a sort of final way, but it can be done with a compassionate intention to give yourself space so that you can really include your own feelings in your life. So sometimes we say kind of, it sounds a bit corny, but we kind of say yes to ourselves, and that might mean saying no to somebody else for a while, but I think it's important to keep it as a process and not to say this is forever or this is final, um, unless it's obviously something you know has to be. Uh, there are cases like that, but um, to try and keep relationships in general as a work in pro progress, even if you can't see that person again, you can still have a relationship with them in due course in your mind, and it might be a relationship of keeping them at a distance and and just learning not to, to soften the, the resentment rather than to really bring them back into your life. But at least, I mean, sometimes we say we've cut somebody off, but we dwell on them inside. So actually, they're still a bother for us because it's the feelings we haven't really processed. So um, I don't know if that really answers the question at all. But, <laughs> but uh, yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. Um, I've been thinking about the hindrances recently, and I'm wondering, the practice is intended to create a kind of dispassion towards the world, isn't it? So what's the difference between dispassion for the world and a hindrance for the world, you know what I mean? Big just... difference. Yeah. yeah. I don't know that the practice is designed to create dispassion. I would see it rather as a natural result of letting go of the things that harm you. So when you see, for example, that ill will's harmful, you develop dispassion to that suffering, that particular form of suffering. So it's kind of as easy as, say, putting your hand on the fire. You obviously have aversion to that, so you withdraw. So it's not quite the same as anger. It's just a knowing that this is suffering and pulling away. 
So, I mean, dispassion, or if you like, uh, kind of letting things fade is a natural outcome of seeing the suffering inherent in those things. So with the hindrances, I mean, with anything in practice, we actually have to experience them first to understand the way they cause us suffering. Because if we just say, well, ill will's wrong, or lost is wrong, or doubt is bad, sleepiness is bad, and we kind of try to suppress it, we don't really see how it's hurting us. So I think we have to gain a familiarity with these things first. And then through wisdom, through seeing that these things are kind of blocking us on the path and getting a skillful way of relating to them, naturally we start to let go. The letting go or dispassion happens on its own. So it's more an outcome of wisdom than, um, than a hindrance, yeah. Yeah. Yes, Chi. Just like to say thank you for um, raising up such a beautiful topic. I don't hear many monastics talking about forgiveness. And in terms of staying in the present moment, I always found like I, you know, uh, when you try to do it directly, you almost have to use willpower. Whereas when you um, say, okay, what happened yesterday, I forgive it. It's a softer way than settle into the present. So uh, thank you for uh, yeah, um, using yeah, that forgiveness to facilitate that, helping us to show, uh, helping showing us the way. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Do you want to say anything? No, that's true. That's very, it's, uh, I never thought of it that way, that, um, that we force ourselves to be in the present moment. But using forgiveness to, to allow us to be in the present moment. Yeah, thank you for that. Mm. Mm. And the softness of that, mm. the softness that makes the present moment an attractive place. Because it's not only letting go of the past and the kind of suffering of that, which obviously prevents us being in the moment, but it's also making the present a nice place to abide, I think. And it's that softness which can be created by forgiveness or metta or compassion that kind of has to go hand in hand, I think, with, this, um, with the mindfulness because it does help kind of keep the mind in the moment simply because it's a kind of cozy place to be. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Do you want to ask Venable Pekka? Could you elaborate a bit about the, the non-self or say a little bit how you think you can find it or arrive there? Right. Or is that mm-hmm. too difficult a question? Right, gosh. Yes, that's, that's <laughs> I, ironically, it's something that I do contemplate quite often, and the Buddha does use as his fundamental teaching. It's like, if you understand non-self, nothing is a problem anymore. So it is quite the key. It is the, it is an important concept, at least to um, having the background of our practice, even though we don't quite understand it, knowing that this is at the end where we're trying to get to, understanding that, understanding that um, we're not in control. So in the everyday practice of it, um, for me, it is learning to step back and not being the one running the show. So uh, Ajahn Brahm calls it the doer. I don't know if you've listened to his talks the doer, the one who is um, uh, managing the show. And so one time he talked, during a retreat, he said, there are two parts of your brain. It's very simple. There's the doer and there's the knower. Most of the time we put all our energy into the doer, the fixer-upper, the one who's um, telling, telling everybody what to do. And instead to more and more put your aware, put your energy into the knower, the one who just knows, the one who is just aware. And, and so there is, there is something to do per se, but it's not so uh, manipulative. So I, 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 I think of it that way, to get to non-self through putting energy into the knower. 
and just being aware of things. No, that's very yeah. Helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for a beautiful talk. Super helpful. I have so many questions. <laughs> I hope I will be able to make a sensible one. Yeah. Um, what, if I, uh, what if it's the case uh, that your conscious thinking mind, you know, the, the intellectual part, knows exactly, oh, come on, this person is not doing anything on purpose, um, and if something annoys you or triggers you, it's only because it triggers you something to do with them, but then there's other part of me, or anything. And I would probably call it maybe, um, maybe it's my inner child, because that's how it really feels, uh, like a young part of me. That is, it gets really upset, it becomes resentful, I start like responding in a very immature way, it's nothing at inappropriately or yeah and creating resentment and there's this mature side of me like to the adult what, what are you doing why and and they are both and, and the young one is trying to justify like yeah uh, yeah, yeah and it's yeah. really really tough and sometimes they are the, the immature one just runs the show yeah um, for a moment, if the moments are now shorter than they used to mm -hmm. be, like to uh, what was it, like teaching and meditation, but when it happens, it's like a really a thought I knew better in the morning. <laughs> yeah. And then I, I how do I reverse that? How is, because sometimes it feels like I don't even have the capacity to. Uh, to have a normal relationship with the person that I created the resentment for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you're talking about how to create this. Uh, uh, I, I would say the answer actually is in creating a relationship between the adult part of you and the inner child that hurts. And you were kind of using language sort of suggesting that the way you, the adult part talks to that inner child is, oh, come on, you know come on, pull yourself up, kind of, you should know better, you're doing that again. So I think that really it takes a lot of tenderness and to actually, first of all, develop a relationship of compassion to that inner child. So to instead be that mature, wise adult who recognizes this is a child who's hurting and it doesn't know better. And instead of, oh, come on, you know, speaking to that part of you with a lot of tender care and a lot of reassurance, and you know, feeling the pain of that inner child that needs to kind of thrash out or feels really hurt and, and saying, you know, it's okay, I understand you, tell me more. Actually listening in and respecting that part of yourself and guiding that part of yourself using the more wise, spiritual, mature part, if you like. So I think rather than rejecting that inner child, which obviously needs to um, express itself and is a part of everybody actually, um, it's about bringing it in and actually giving it the care that it maybe didn't receive when it needed it. So it's almost like we have to reparent our inner child, you know, and just, um, yeah, learn to have empathy and compassion and a lot of patience to that. So that's all part of the forgiveness. And it's great that you've identified the different parts inside because then you know where the forgiveness is needed. And sometimes before you can forgive the person who triggers it, you have to forgive that inner part of yourself. So I would work there. Totally. I, I, that's what I did. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm doing that. Yeah. So, like, yeah. 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 It's just a problem that, like, so, like little damage. No, nothing much. Sure. Yeah. Little damage is already done. I cannot come and explain to these people. But you can actually, maybe you actually can say, you know, something in me is being triggered and it's not personal to you. And I'm sorry, I'm working on it, but this is the best I can do right now. Because a lot of the time, the reason people are hurt is because they feel it's personal. I notice that in myself, because in my role, I get a lot of projections coming my way. 
especially being a perceived authority now, and maybe people have told me I actually am an authority, which is kind of scary, because um, I feel like a human being, but obviously it's a role that one has to take. Um, and so there are projections, and sometimes I really have to remind myself, you know, it really isn't about me. It's, it's really about what that person's going through. And sometimes I have to also not engage too much with that because then I feel it's my responsibility and it can get into like the fixing mode, which is tricky, right? Because you want to help them genuinely out of compassion, but a part of you wants them not to be that way, so it's better for you. So it's kind of sometimes you have to just learn to let people have their um, reactions and you just trust that you're doing your best, you know, and not to take it so personally. So in a similar way, you could help that other person too to realize that, perhaps. I don't know. Yeah. Yes. Um, it, it, it kind of follows from that, because um, um, when I'm deluded, uh, really caught up, and I'm really believing in it, I mean really, really believing mm -hmm. it, and then when I come out of it, I'm kind of like, what on earth was yeah. that? <laughs> and, um, I would say whether it's happening less or, or to less of a degree, um, um, or less often, um, it seems more intense, and I don't, and I don't know in whether it is actually more intense, or actually my um, tolerance, I'm not even sure if that's the right word, tolerance between kind of being more able to come back to the present, mm -hmm. and then seeing the craziness of the delusion, because it really is at times it's kind of like, well, that is just, you know, to, to use a term if it's okay, kind of psychotic. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the Buddha said we're sick when we're angry, we're like a sick person. So at that time we don't see clearly. So it's an interesting one, because I do think as we practice, we're more aware of the suffering these emotions cause, these afflictive emotions. Sometimes it seems we have more of them, but I think it's usually that we're just more aware of them and maybe um, less, yeah, less uh, willing to entertain them perhaps and more eager to get back to a state of balance again. So it's not a bad thing so long as you don't blame yourself and berate yourself for it having happened. But maybe just to remind yourself next time that if I get angry again, I'll try not to believe the thoughts. Because one thing you can know is that if any of the five hindrances are present, the thoughts are going to be skewed. Your perceptions are going to be skewed. You know, you're going to see this person as having all kinds of bad intentions and, you know, things that they're doing out of spite or... <laughs> and actually later on, when you, if you are able to talk to the person and find out what was happening to them, you'll find it was nothing like that at all. So I think for me, you know, if I um, know that I'm kind of tired or a bit irritated, then I'm inclined to be careful of landing on anything solid because I know from experience that when I'm exhausted again, I'll see it completely differently and I'll see all the person's good qualities and, you know, probably be able to sit down calmly and just share how I, how I feel without blaming them for that. So, yeah, but it's natural. <laughs> it's part, part of the course. What do you think? Uh, well, I think we do become more sensitive as we practice. So small things seem to be like, oh my God, what an idiot I am. <laughs> but actually it's just your mind is becoming more clear. You know what is going on. So in a way it's a, I think a good thing that you stop having perspective, that's true. Or is that really as bad as, as it seems in my mind? Um, at the end of the day, we have to accept all the phases of our life, or lives, all the phases of our mind, and really be patient. Yeah, really be patient. Know that it's going to happen. <laughs> yes. Mm, it was anger to sixes, definitely, because it's the six uh, ways of overcoming resentment. And I have a feeling it's one four. Uh, I thought it was four something four nine, one four nine, possibly. 
And then you mentioned ignoring because I feel it is something. Oh, yeah. I yeah. do a lot. You know, I say, because I can't handle it a lot of the time, you know. I, I am triggered by something. And then I say to myself, oh, let me try to be understanding kind of. I can't do it. It keeps coming back up yeah. with intensity. So I just go, you know what? Um, if I don't leave it alone, I can't be around this person. So just forget about it. <laughs> Um, but uh, it's just a lesser way of dealing with it. Yeah. It is. Is it a lesser way? Yeah. Is, no, is no, 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 I don't think so. You mean you're kind of forgetting the resentment so you can be around them? Yeah? Huh? You're kind yeah, of dropping. Are you supposed to forget it then try to step all back to it later? I think uh, it is one way you can do it. I mean, even in the Vinaya of the monks and nuns, there's a way of settling disputes called covering it over with grass. And it's really interesting because I always thought that's not a great way because I actually prefer to kind of look at the causes for things and not just kind of, you know, put the grass on top. But sometimes it's really helpful because we can't kind of go into depth with everything and not every relationship is worth it either. So sometimes putting a bit of grass on top, so to speak, or just leaving it be for a while is quite a skillful thing to do because you're not in the frame of mind at that time to address it and later on it may just get resolved on its own quite often it does that's Ajahn Brahm's preferred method for many things actually because <laughs> he doesn't want to spend too much energy <laughs> uh, but he also just trusts that people kind of know when they've gone off course and eventually they will do the right thing and I think sometimes for me anyway in my life because I tend to want to sort things out now and obviously not everybody's ready straight away. I actually find it safer to talk and open things up than to kind of have stuff bubbling. But I've realized that for some people that's too confrontational. Or they're just not ready. So sometimes just waiting is a really good skill. And you might find the person kind of then shows you another side and you just forget that thing. Or maybe if it becomes habitual, you can find a good time to talk about it that's non-confrontational, maybe. So I think whatever works. I mean, it would kind of go under this idea of ignoring. It's, it's difficult, like, right, mm. talking things through because yeah. sometimes you're trying to and the other person doesn't take that off either. Yeah. Makes, makes things yes. Work, exactly. You to some people you can talk to them and say, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. That's all things. So right. Some people, even you talking to them about what, whatever's happening. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's right, and I think it depends on, you know, partly on maybe our life experiences. Like sometimes people have been criticized so much in their life. Like I feel like that actually. Like I feel like it's never been quite good enough, whatever I do. And I think as a result, I'm kind of sensitive to feedback. I mean, I will take it, but I need it to be done in a really kind way when I'm resourced enough because actually what I need is a lot of building up, believe it or not. <laughs> and my teacher knows that, and so he always just, he actually doesn't build you up that much, but he kind of gives you his trust, you know, and he's there no matter whether you're good or whether you're bad, and I think that's quite skillful. Like, he doesn't actually praise me too much either, because then I'll feel again I have something to live up to, and I have to be perfect. <laughs> um, so sometimes people are really sensitive, and I think it's maybe not, it's maybe more important in that case to be very careful about the time that you choose and to make sure that it's a safe space for that person, maybe even to ask them, like, is it a good time? And maybe uh, do something kind for them first. Uh, send them meta. You know, do a lot of work beforehand in your own mind so that you know you have a heart of loving kindness. You tune into them a bit. You're gentle with them. You help them to feel safe. I think that can be really skillful. Because the Buddha did say there's like five or six things, five, I think. There's all these lists, but it's helpful sometimes of right speech of, or of kind of giving feedback, let's say. And one is um, that you have a mind of loving kindness. One is that it's the right time. So it doesn't just mean, it kind of means like don't do it in public as well. Um, do it at a quiet time. Maybe ask them if they're tired or how they're feeling, first of all. Um, if you know they've undergone bereavement, maybe don't do it <laughs> at that time. Um, so metta, uh, is it timely? Is it beneficial? Is it going to be beneficial? Could it be beneficial? Is it true, of course? And then um, are you using gentle speech? And sometimes, yeah, sometimes we think we need to say more than we do. 
sometimes even just a little kind of look or a couple of words is enough. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Venerable? I wanted to ask a practical question, which I suppose leads on a bit from what you were just saying about kindness and about the triggers. So I'm going to, uh, at some point this summer, I'll be in a situation around people that I'm not yet ready to forgive. Um, and I'm just thinking, or asking practical ways to protect myself, um, because once I've set up boundaries and asked for no contact, I can't trust that that's not going to happen. They've overstepped those boundaries several times before. So, yeah, just any practical things to help when that situation arises. Um, obviously, preparation through loving kindness towards yourself really just towards yourself, not towards them, because that will help you establish boundaries and notice when you're moving out of a space of feeling resourced. And then I think if you're entering a situation and they're around, you need to have some get out clauses, <laughs> maybe some phrases, practice some phrases, just saying things like, um, I'm not feeling able to engage right now. Um, I'll come back later giving them the reassurance that you're not just running away, but that right now is not a good time. And just going, don't say, don't kind of wait for permission. Don't wait for them to give you the go ahead, but notice before you're kind of tipping into like fight flight um, and say right now, um, I just need a quick break or I need a, a long break maybe. Um, I'm going to have some time alone and not entering that situation with the person until you feel ready. Um, I mean, the most practical thing might be that if you have to meet somebody difficult, is it possible to have like a chaperone or someone you trust to be present and to be a witness to that? Because just having a good person by your side, you know, is really, really helpful. It's one reason that Venerable Pekka came across, right? Because, not because my supporters are trouble, <laughs> absolutely anything but. I mean, actually, there's a lot of love in this community, but still, when there are two people present, People are less likely to start projecting or saying things that are less skillful because they're kind of in company, right? It's not just you and them. So I would say try to avoid being with people alone if, if they're people that have hurt you in the past. Um, be in a place that's safe. Maybe if you find yourself in a small room with somebody and it feels a bit intense, especially if it's their space, their workspace or their space that they hang out with their friends. Maybe invite them to sit outside somewhere that you like to be, or you know, have somebody around somewhere. <laughs> um, limit your time from the beginning, maybe if you possibly can. You know, have somewhere to go that night that's not the same place, just as a backup, just in case. Um, anything else practical? Sleep as well as you can. <laughs> Drink lots of water. <laughs> and you can recite phrases of loving kindness when you're in difficult situations. You can just recite them to yourself and it has this calming effect, especially if they're ones that you use in the practice regularly, because it's just almost like association, you know, the mind knows, ah, this is something I can just rest with um, and just keep on with that. But I would say the main thing is to remove yourself before you feel trigger too triggered, if at all possible and just respect your boundaries in that way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Anything okay. else? Well, I think the main thing is from now to then to really focus on, on valuing your own self. Because quite often you believe their stories because you don't believe in yourself. So, even, I know it's hard to do, but but uh, when you are with them, if you are able to to be with yourself and not buy into whatever stuff is going on around, the more you can be within and be 
yeah, be with yourself, then whatever people say, really, it can be water over your back. So really work, really, really looking at yourself and loving yourself. Because, yeah, that's your greatest ally. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so as, as we were talking about the uh, making, uh, like covering it or uh, yeah, ignoring. Um, so if we decide to remove ourselves from that situation because we get triggered or whatever. I'm worried that they would be like giving up, mm. like rather than face it, just, just right. face it and yeah. deal with it. Yeah. And um, so, I, um, again, I would be like, oh, I'll call myself a loser, but I don't, I don't want that. So obviously, but it's, <laughs> it's, it's a pop, uh, it's a thought in my head that crosses yeah. my mind. Yeah. Well, then you're not gonna, you're not gonna deal with it. You're just gonna run away from it. So. Um, is, is, is it that an option? Maybe deal with it later? When, when yeah, absolutely. Because you're protecting yourself. Maybe you have to be very clear about your intention at that time. You know, just to, to remind yourself that you're not running away. You're just putting it down for a while. Mm -hmm. Just like when you're tired at work, you put down, turn off the computer for a while, and you have a break, you rest yourself, you resource yourself. Mm -hmm. So if you see that your mind's getting kind of agitated and you're not really sure how to approach a situation, you can just say to yourself, right, I'm not running away. I just see that my mind's a bit agitated at the moment. I'll come back to it later. I'll trust that my mind will be calmer later on and that I'll have the courage later to address it. And I'll wait for the right time. So I think it's a lot about trust and patience. Um, because obviously you have the intention. You're probably somebody I'm gathering. You might be somebody who actually, in a way, prefers to face it. It feels kind of more courageous or, I don't know, is that? Is I'm that? sorry about the okay. confrontation uh, and, and, okay. and, um, <coughs> and, and even if it doesn't need to be a confrontation, yeah. but when I'm starting to build up like a resentment mm. or if there's a little bit of a problem, for whatever reason, in my mind, there's not even an option to go and sit down with the person okay. and say, look, this is how I feel. And that person is someone that is so, it's a normal good person. You know, then they, yeah. they come to me and say, is everything okay? Mm. I feel like such a loser, because, but no, okay, no, no. <laughs> I feel very silly for like, oh, this is so simple. We could just talk about it. Why is it an okay to me? Why? Yeah, maybe How you don't I feel safe enough yet. Mm. It could be this little child that just doesn't feel kind of yeah. Yeah. safe yeah. enough. So many times uh, it, it has happened that we had a conversation and everything was fine. Mm. Yet still, I don't come up with that idea myself. You don't come up with? With the idea of, like, oh, let, let's, let's, yeah. let's talk, let's talk. say how we feel. How, mm. Mm. So, mm. It's not even an option. Yeah. It's okay that I have to just, I will sort it out, I'll sort it out myself. Mm. Mm. I think it could be insecurity. Personally, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. For me, if that's the case, it's usually insecurity, either in myself or my intention or feeling that I'll be accepted or not with a person. So I kind of have to find that love for myself, first of all. Yeah. A sense of safety with myself, with my feelings, and also with the relationship. I mean, you wouldn't just do it with anybody. I don't think. But if you see that it's a habit and that it builds up and it builds up and it can, then it can destroy the relationship. I mean, I've had that happen before in relationships where I think everything's fine and then suddenly somebody comes out with this whole rush of anger and it's like, where did it come from? Why didn't you talk to me? And that is destructive because everybody needs to feel safe. They don't want to feel that they're with a kind of sleeping volcano <laughs> that can explode at any time. So I think, you know, maybe... A lot of kindness to yourself, but 
helping yourself feel safe before approaching that person, maybe? Um, I don't know. You want well, to say something? Well, no, yeah, it's also how you speak to that person. Yeah. It's like not saying, you're the problem. It's saying, this is how I tend to react when I hear this. Yeah. So not to feel that they feel mm. blamed, but rather this is, this is my tendency and, and these words bring up this tendency so they don't feel so confronted. Oh, totally. Yeah. Take ownership for yeah. okay. <laughs> Right. It's okay. You know, with, with things like, uh, oh, you know, feeling is just feeling. Can people just get into this mood where they... Yeah, bypass. Yeah, like they don't do it things because they're like, oh, you know, in ultimate re reality, this right. way, that's what I'm It's And it's... It's, it's, it's bypass. Like, yeah, I, I think that's kind of using spiritual ideas to actually avoid um, doing the work from the ground up, so to speak, because we haven't understood non-self. It's just a, an idea that feelings are just feelings. As long as we're reacting, we're not seeing feelings as just feelings. We're reacting to them. So we have to start where we are. Um, and yeah, this is sometimes the danger in kind of jumping to those concepts too soon. But if we actually work with our in our practice to observe that feelings are just feelings. In other words, not to devalue them or to invalidate them, but just to see they're real, they exist, but they also change. They can't be kind of relied on as something um, really meaningful and really intrinsic to me. You know, this is how I am and this is how I feel. And uh, so we don't have so much attachment to them, but we still um, acknowledge them and validate them. Um, and we can talk about them as well. But I think, for me anyway, over the years, it's been easier to talk about feelings and emotions with other people without quite so much identification. I can talk about them more like phenomena arising than this is, you know, what I really, really think and feel. It can be more like, oh, I noticed that there's some irritation. Gosh, look at that, you know. Or there's some frustration. Mm, I thought I'd worked with that one, but it, here it is again. I guess everyone has frustration, right? So it starts to become a little bit less personal. You have a bit more space around it. But you don't say, well, it doesn't matter, because it's part of the mental landscape. Yeah. So I think we have to be kind to our feelings before we sort of just ignore them straight away. Yeah. Yeah. We've probably got time for one or two more. OK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you've done something wrong to somebody or hurt somebody, you understood that you hurt and you feel, um, you say, okay, I'm not going to do that again, and you forgive yourself, and according to the station, should I be going and asking for forgiveness? Mm -hmm. I'm not going to do that again, and I'll be quiet about it. Is that enough? Uh -huh. It's really up to you. It depends how much. So the question was, is it enough just to forgive or uh, is it better or is it necessary to ask forgiveness? Do you want to answer that? Um, well, of course, if you can, it's great. If you can, you'll feel better. So, but if you're not ready to, that's another question. You have to sort of ask for forgiveness from a distance first and mm -hmm. prepare yourself mentally for the right answer. <laughs> uh, yeah, but if you can, if you can have the cut, and it's also saying it the, in the right way, sometimes you go and say, sorry, 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 you know? And that's not really, it's like, you know, please forgive me so that I feel better about myself. <laughs> that's also not quite, quite, it comes from a sort of um, ego as well. But to genuinely say sorry with, uh, with sort of um, self-integrity, that takes time. So it's an art. It's an art, yeah. Yeah. Does yeah. that help? Or? In Buddhism, we do have like forgiveness ceremonies, and uh, it's quite a lovely thing. 
Yeah, Ajahn Brahm often um, encourages people who, if he married, he doesn't marry them, but you know, he's there at the ceremony. Uh, <laughs> if he could, he'd probably try to <laughs> encourage them to reconsider. But anyway, he, he does marry them. <laughs> no, not really. He wants them to be happy together. But he, one of the most important ways that he tries to encourage uh, that happiness and that lack of resentment over the years is to um, suggest that they do a forgiveness ceremony every anniversary. And they just um, tell each other, first of all, the things they appreciate in each other, and then they apologize and they give something special to the other person. It might be something tiny, but it's just a little gesture because ceremonies tend to stick and tend to mean more in the heart. There's a lot of thought goes into them. So it's a good opportunity to like build up a lot of uh, good intention and then when that becomes stronger, it manifests in uh, the speech, first of all, and then in maybe giving a gift. So I think this is a very beautiful and humbling thing to do. And I've never really met anyone that um, doesn't feel happy when someone apologizes genuinely or asks their forgiveness. It's actually a gift to them too, not only to yourself. So, But it's not like there's a hard or fast, you should, you must. Um, yeah, you have to find out for yourself. Yeah. I mean, sometimes we apologize way too much. Ajahn Brahm sometimes tells me I have too much sorry -tude and not enough silly -tude. <laughs> But we all have a lot of sorry -tude in this country. I saw a little uh, video on uh, a tube. <laughs> it was this little um, children's video, and this mom was playing it to a baby. And it goes, sorry, excuse me, sorry, excuse me, these are the words that nice words you can say. <laughs> it just went on and on like that. <laughs> and I was like, my goodness, this is why we're constantly apologizing and saying, excuse me, <laughs> for living. So, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, we shouldn't, you know, kind of come from that place of... Uh, really low self-esteem, I'm so sorry, I'm, so, I'm terrible, I'm so sorry, I'm just, you know, blown it again, kind of. Yeah, there's a difference there. <laughs> All right, is that good? Has anyone a burning last minute, one minute question? Something, someone who hasn't raised anything? No? All right. So... I think we're near, very near to the end of the day, and um, we're going to do some guided meditation to end. And uh, it's time to get comfy, I guess. <laughs> so, just closing our eyes and letting the words, the music, the impressions of the day just gently settle, perhaps fall off the edge of our mental screen of awareness. To notice the space inside our body, inside this room. Perhaps even a little bit more space inside the heart, a softness or a sense of more understanding, more compassion for ourselves and the world. And perhaps practicing a little bit of metta meditation to end the day. Metta, first of all, to this body that we push around. By imagining that your body is just basking in the light of mindfulness, and the warmth of kindness, like the light and the warmth of the sun.
so that awareness is just receiving whatever it notices without any effort at all. You're just relaxing back in your chair or on your cushion as though you're on a very comfortable armchair being basked in the gentle rays of the sun. developing a friendly attitude towards this body. Who so graciously serves you night and day. Forgiving your body for maybe not being as healthy or as young or as pretty, attractive as you might like to be, or think you might like to be. Really valuing your body as a very dear and close friend. Enjoying any sensations that feel easeful, maybe light or gentle, soft. Any parts of the body that are not uncomfortable right now. And allowing the mind to rest with those. If it's comfortable for you, maybe allowing the mind, the awareness to rest around the heart, <coughs> the chest. and wishing yourself well by using some phrases of loving kindness or compassion towards yourself. Just gently reciting phrases such as, may I be happy, May I be free. May I be healed. May I be at peace.
finding those words, those wishes that resonate deeply for you. And offering each phrase, or maybe only one phrase, to yourself as a gift, like planting a seed in the soil of your heart, a very fertile soil. And pausing between each phrase to allow the light and the sun, the light and the warmth of the sun, kind awareness or kindfulness. to bring this seed to life. Just planting the seed and allowing metta, loving kindness, to grow in its own time. Noticing the feelings as they arise. being so gentle and undemanding towards those feelings. Accepting if you don't feel very much at all. It's perfectly fine. Just delighting in these beautiful intentions And perhaps bringing to mind a very dear friend or partner, child, maybe teacher, someone who you feel really safe and at ease to be around. And allowing this metta, these feelings and intentions of loving kindness to flow out to them. Perhaps imagining this being smiling into your eyes, relaxing as you bathe them in loving kindness from head to toe. As if they're really right there in front of you now. Staying connected to your own heart center or any feelings in the body that are pleasant or neutral.
trusting that your metta is reaching this person. But it is enough just to care. And keeping this person close, included. Now allow the metta to start spreading into this room. just as though a golden glow were emanating from your chest or maybe your whole body, every pore. And spreading out toward everyone in this room. giving us all the support that we need, that feeling of acceptance. A sense of nurture, tender care. May all of us here today, practicing this beautiful, forgiving, loving kindness, May we all be happy and well. May we be free from fear, from resentment, bitterness, numbness, may we embrace ourselves just as we are. And have no obstacles on our path. May we be safe, healthy, and free. May we all be at peace. Imagining each being in this room, whether their face comes to mind or not, Receiving this combined loving kindness, relaxing more deeply, feeling at ease, happy, love. And now this loving kindness starts spreading through the windows, down the stairs, up towards the residential part of this building and into the streets where people are trying to create a feeling of happiness and unity in whatever way they know how. May all beings in this whole area, this beautiful ancient city of learning, may they all be free. May they also partake in our peace, our harmony, and however much happiness we've developed inside. May all beings in this city be at ease, be safe, be free.
And just allowing this loving kindness to spread way beyond this city across the UK. To anyone who comes to mind who you may know in your family, your work environment, perhaps someone in hospital or going through a hard time. Many beings in this, city, in this country, just like them, may they all be happy. safe, well, and at peace, whoever they are, whatever they've done. And allowing this matter to spread, perhaps across the planet Earth, or maybe simply in every direction, from this room, as far as it will, across the land masses, the oceans and seas, to all beings, not only human beings, but animals, insects, birds and creatures of the sea. All beings, visible or invisible, May they all be happy and well. All beings who may be right now harming other beings, may their anger subside. May they receive our loving kindness and find peace. knowing that all beings have the capacity to harm one another, just like us, imperfect, fallible human beings or animals driven by their instincts, knowing nothing else, not even intending to inflict harm, but some simply just to survive. May all beings in this universe, wherever life is found, may they all be happy. May they all be free. Just imagining that for a moment, all beings at peace. What an incredible planet that would be. Just resting with this sense of loving kindness towards all beings for a moment. Allowing yourself to relax, to breathe.
just enjoying any peace inside. As you once again come back to your own body and mind. Leaving that glow of loving kindness outside. And coming back into your heart. Into your inner world right now. And if you wish, thinking of any being or beings that you may have harmed with a simple intention to ask forgiveness. If I've hurt or harmed any living being, intentionally or unintentionally, by body, speech or mind, I ask forgiveness. And if there are any beings who've hurt or harmed me by their deeds of body, speech, or mind, knowingly or unknowingly, intentionally or unintentionally, I offer those beings my intention to forgive if I'm not able to forgive them yet. Knowing that this may take time and giving it all the time that I need to come to that place of forgiveness and peace with any being who's harmed me. Just resting with that possibility for now. And lastly, we come to ourself, perhaps the hardest person to forgive yet the one we live with and know so closely, so intimately. To me, the one I'm closest to, I offer myself forgiveness
or if I'm not yet ready to forgive certain parts of me that perhaps have been shamed or rejected. I offer those parts of myself the sincere intention to forgive, to bring them home, to include all those parts of myself, of my life, in my heart. No matter what I've done through body, speech or mind, that has hurt or harmed myself. I seek my own forgiveness. Knowing that this may take time I offer myself the intention to forgive my body, my mind, my emotions, my hormones, my race, my gender, my sexuality, whatever it is, my intellect, abilities, I offer myself complete acceptance and forgiveness, unconditionally. I offer myself the intention to develop forgivingness, a soft, patient, forgiving heart of loving kindness throughout my life. May I be my own best friend and companion on this path, no matter how difficult it may get. And be a companion and guide to many other beings. As a result. I'll end with some chanting which you can just listen to and receive. Sabe Sata Sabe Pana Sabe Sabe Purgala Sabe Atta Bawa Paria Pana Sabaiti Sabe Purisa Sabe Ariya Sabe Anariya Sabe Deva Sabe Manusa Sabe Vinipadika Avira Hontu Avya 
enjoyed the day and uh, we're going to invite up our friend Derek who many of you may have had contact with over this time I've never seen who Derek is to say a few words to end the day and then he'll hand back to me and I'll let you know what's coming next because we are going away quite soon out of England but there's lots more things happening in our community so Okay, well, firstly, I'd like to start by thanking our venerable teachers. Thank you very much for the teachings today, for the guidance, for the meditation, for the teachings about how to forgive. Thank you very much. Very timely as well as a subject. I'm very grateful for this subject today. I'd also like to thank everybody here for being here and for having the chance to meet you in person and not just see you on Zoom like this. <laughs> It's also very nice to see you in real life. And thank you for being here and making it a gentle and kind atmosphere. So I would like to say something about what happened at a volunteer meeting the other day that I was attending. And it was the first volunteer meeting I'd attended for a while. I know some of you were there as well. And we were talking about the first eight months of the Vihara and how it had grown as a community and how it had led to a nourishing and safe and place of practice. And this is something that is very, very valuable. There's not too many of them around, and we all need them, and we all feel the benefits of having this place to practice and to meet spiritual friends. And I was hearing how nourishing it had been for the teachers as well as for the community to have had this space over the past eight months. And I was also hearing about how there are people who want to come and to train and to be bhikkhunis and to join the community, not just as lay people, but also as part of the Sangha. And this is something amazing as well, which we need to support and to help to build. And one of the ways we can do that is by really working towards this big long-term vision of the Anukampa Bhikkhuni project to have a forest monastery where there's space for people to come and train and to live and to, to, to grow the community and to show that Buddhism has the possibility to really give us lots of peace and, and happiness in this world that we all really need. And the world is sometimes a difficult place, but to have this place where we can go to that is safe and, and welcoming and great teachings is really so valuable. So we'd really appreciate it if you could help us by supporting this aim with any donations. All of the teachings are given on a donation basis. Any money you're able to give is greatly received and gratefully received. And there's the opportunity to give, there's a donation box somewhere. There are also uh, gift aid envelopes which you can fill in and give to Minori if she's still here. Okay. And Alternatively, there's the opportunity to donate online. The bank details are in the leaflet, which is also downstairs or online, anukampaproject.org forward slash donate. There are also other ways to support the community, but at this precise moment in time, the best way is through donations because our teachers are going to be on retreat for the next 
four months or so, which is also a wonderful way to support the community by supporting their retreats. So <laughs> I would like to, if I may, um, pay my respects to you as I would say thank you very much again and any donations are really gratefully received. Thank you. Thank you, for Thank you for articulating what this means to you and hopefully others mm -hmm. so beautifully. Um, and also you included what it means to us, which is a lot of love coming back to us. <laughs> it's really touching actually. It's been amazing the last eight, nine months. It's just been the fruits of so many years of hard work and so many teachings and just planting seeds, you know, this is what can happen. We don't realise that uh, Sometimes seeds can take a long time to really take root and to germinate and to show their first shoots. And sometimes we think the seed's dead or <laughs> the soil was never the right soil. Or there's not enough sun or too much rain. But if you just keep persevering, you know, with the right intentions and shining that kindfulness on those seeds, it's really incredible where we can come to. And it is the beginnings. I mean, there's a fairly large, wider community. It's a very tiny community on ground, but on the ground. Um, but we'll build that up from inside. And I've always been really clear to Adrian Brown that getting a bigger place is not my aim. Getting a beautiful community is my aim. And as the community grows, the place will grow to accommodate it. And I'm glad I've stuck to that because, you know, we could have probably got something bigger that would have finish me off in terms of <laughs> workload and all the rest. But um, it has to grow in sync with the people who live there and who support us. And you can do that in so many ways. You know, it's wonderful. I think you're right, Derek, that at the moment, getting new volunteers. We need to consolidate the groups we have. I know one of you has also offered to join because you didn't get to the meeting and we'll figure out a way. But I hope you're all in this long term and you have the patience to find your way with us. And as we grow, we'll have more and more opportunities to, yeah, really be part of a beautiful community. So it's not just centered around the so-called leaders, but it's centered around each other as well. It's like the whole thing is this beautiful entity that grows in reciprocity in various ways. And um, what I wanted to say really was that although we're leaving, I'm leaving, Venerable Pecker's leaving and hopefully will return, but she's not resident here. Um, I am a UK resident, apparently. I spent most of my life <laughs> in Asia, but now I seem to be back. And uh, it's growing on me. <laughs> it's growing around me anyway. Uh, <laughs> so we'll see what happens. But um, uh, in our absence, we have uh, uh, put together a program across the summer. And we actually have like three or four bikinis every month to offer teachings during the next four months. One of them is Venerable Opeka. You'll be doing like three teachings across three months. And there are some others who are doing like three teachings each or something like that. And I don't think there's any platform I've seen anywhere in the world. I just feel grateful for this. It's not a sort of I'm so great, but it's hard to get teachings from bhikkhunis. And we've managed to develop a platform thanks to everybody and Matthias as well, incredibly much because you, you know, upload so many teachings onto the YouTube channel and you know, you're there at all the Zoom events. Derek also was there for many years at all the Zoom events as co-host. Um, and because of this, we can have uh, a platform for other women to teach. Uh, not only white women, also uh, brown women, and also non-binary. These are bikunis, right? Non-binary bikunis. Hopefully soon we'll get um, transgender bikunis, who knows? And black bikunis and any bikuni. But we want to have a wide representation because we are all a bit different, although we're ultimately the same inside, but we need to see ourselves modeled. We need to see examples that we can look up to and say, oh, if they can do it and if they can live this life, maybe it's something for me too. Mm -hmm. So um, hopefully it's for the men as well. Um, I notice we get really kind and gentle men who are equally as interested in hearing from bikunis and feel that something's amiss when there's only one gender represented. So we need the bhikkhu and the bikuni sangha, not only the monks, uh, not only the nuns. Mm -hmm. So this is something really lovely that uh, Ajahn Brahmali's very nicely written a little article for the next newsletter. And he said, you know, 
that having the Bhikkhuni Sangha is part of bringing early Buddhism back to the UK because the Buddha himself said that if you only have, you need the fourfold assembly, that means the lay people of all genders, the Bhikkhuni and Bhikkhu Sangha, um, to have, yeah, for it to be viable and long lasting basically. Otherwise it's like a chair with three legs. It's not three legs like a stool, but a chair with three legs. I wouldn't be sitting on it now, I'd be like on the floor. So that's what happens to Buddhism. Falls down onto the floor, you have to scrape it up and put it back into its elevated position above the clouds. So anyway, no, it's, it's grounded in reality. So. <laughs> but um, we, need, we need everybody involved. So thank you, and I won't keep waffling on. Um, I shouldn't really say that, it's a bit self-deprecating, but I won't keep you any longer. Uh, because I'm sure you all have somewhere to go. And so, yeah, I would like to end the day by thanking everybody here for coming and uh, making it a beautiful space. So take yeah. care. And thank you, Venerable Pekka, as well, because we did say, let's do something together before, I particularly said, before she leaves, and she was a little bit hesitant, <laughs> but I think by now you're so much a part of the community. <laughs> nah, you weren't dragged. You didn't have to drag at all. She's like... Cool as a cucumber. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, you contributed beautifully and I, I really enjoyed listening to your talks and meditations today. So thank you very much. Take care, everybody.